Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Still setting up the office and many of you have been pointing out various knickknacks you'd like to see in the background. For example, recently I bought this Chernobyl Liquidators Medal. This is a medal given to the people that cleaned up the radioactive uh, waste, debris and various other stuff from Chernobyl. But in the last couple of days, everyone has been sending me this Saturn One, which is apparently available from the Marshall Space Flight Center for free, plus the price of shipping, which is about a quarter of a million dollars. Also, I think you have to probably be an institution or a museum if you want it, but it's actually really cool because the Saturn I is one of my favorite rockets for various reasons. So this looks from the pictures to be a Saturn I Block I because it doesn't have the fins. So the Saturn I came out in the 1950s. The army was looking for a heavy lift uh, rocket because they had all sorts of great ideas, such as a moon base and they wanted a rocket that could put 9 to 18 tons into low Earth orbit. And von Braun had the perfect idea. He would take his Juno 1 rocket and he would take the Juno 2 rocket, which were basically redstones and Jupiters that had been modified to launch hardware into orbit. And he would cluster eight of these tanks together and one Jupiter tank in the middle, and then they would add eight rocket engines to the bottom that were essentially improved versions from the Jupiter, and that would be the first stage of this monster rocket. He called it the Juno 5 because Juno 3 and 4 were multi-stage versions of the Juno 1 and 2 that never got, take, never got approved. And the rest is history, I guess. I mean, obviously at some point the name got changed to the Saturn 1, but in between it was also called the C1. Um, and then, of course, the Saturn 1 evolved into the Saturn 1B, which was the one that actually launched astronauts on command modules. The Saturn 1s were mostly used as research vehicles, uh, you know, to test the hardware and get everything uprated. Uh, the Saturn 1B, incidentally, they reduced the mass of the hardware, they improved the thrust of the engines, they just made a whole bunch of uh, improvements and they settled on an upper stage in the form of the S4B, which is the same upper stage that was used on the Saturn V rather conveniently. A lot of people don't remember the Saturn 1 because of course the Saturn V is so much gl more glorious, it's huge, everyone thinks of that beastie. Everyone forgets that the last Apollo hardware launched was a Saturn 1B carrying the Apollo Soyuz test project, uh, Apollo. And a funny thing about that is that because the Saturn 1 was so much shorter, but it had the same uh, capsule, the same service module, the same upper stage, what they did for the Skylab and Apollo uh, uh, Soyuz missions is they used the same launch pad, the same launch tower, but because everything was designed for Saturn V height, they had to put in a structure to lift the bottom up. So this rocket launched from what was called the milk stool, and it looks rather comical, but I like it. I think the Saturn I is cute. I mean, the Saturn I is cute anyway, because it kind of represents this uh, you know, crazy clustered idea. It's like in Kerbal Space Program, where you haven't unlocked the larger tanks and the larger engines and you need a heavy lift vehicle. So you cluster everything together and get as much thrust out of this first stage. And it looks comical, but it works. And the Saturn I did work. So in terms of technical hardware, you have eight of these uh, redstone slash Juno 1 tanks around the outside. And in the middle, you have a Jupiter tank. The Jupiter tank's a bit fatter. It contains liquid oxygen. Around the outside, four of them contain uh, liquid oxygen. Those are painted white. And four of them contain RP-1 or kerosene, and those are painted black. Uh, while I say these are tanks, they're really... They, they're not quite the same because they won't, for example, have the internal bulkheads to separate fuel and oxidizer. They're a single long tank. Also, they have a lot of baffles in them, you know, anti-slosh baffles to stop the fuel wobbling around. And there's actually engineering camera footage showing the insides of some of these tanks. The engine on the bottom is the H1. Now, the H1 is derived from the Thor engine and it was the same, similar engine to that was on the, the Jupiter or the Juno F2. But the performance is a bit better, they've simplified the engine, and yeah, there's eight of them. More engines on that rocket than any other NASA first stage rocket, incidentally. Uh, you know, they, they, they thought it was crazy to have eight engines because, of course, you know, if one explodes, you lose them all. And guess what? Falcon 9 has nine, and Falcon Heavy has 27, and Starship is going to have, you know, ridiculous numbers. 
So the four engines in the middle of this, uh, the thrust plate on the bottom are fixed. They just hold position. The four on the outside, they gimbal and they provide all the roll and yaw and pitch control. Uh, there's another, there's an interesting difference between these engines as well. The four engines in the middle, they exhaust their gas generator uh, exhaust over the side, right? There's these you know little flares coming out the side. But the outside ones, they use uh, a gas generator exhaust around the tip of the nozzle. So it looks like a, a film cooling. It's you know dark and then you get the light coming through here. I, I think that's great. And I never quite figured out exactly why this decision was taken and I suspect that it's something to do with the outside engines gimballing and they didn't want the super hot exhaust uh, distant, you know, to uh, impinge on anything. I would love to find that out if anyone has actual information. So the Saturn, the first four Block 1 Saturn ones, they didn't have the fins. The Block 2, they got the fins because of course this was a rocket by Von Braun. These uh, fins would also uh, take structural load while it was sitting on the pad. Uh, the test rockets, they none of them ever got to orbit, the, these early Block 1s. They would have an instrument unit inside this first stage. Once they switched to the S-4B, of course, the instrument unit was on the top of that stage instead. Um, but yeah, that is uh, one of my favourite pieces of, you know, uh, US rocket history. This you know, crazy conglomeration of hardware. And I guess in the, uh, Russia, there is the parallel of the Proton where they cluster together a lot of tanks to make the first stage. In this case, it wasn't that they had the hardware all pre-spec'd out, it's that they wanted to make their rocket fit on a train. So the each tank is small enough to fit in a rail car and then they would assemble them all to make the giant first stage. So would I like a Saturn One rocket in my backyard? Well, yes I would, but I live on a hillside so it would probably fall down and hurt the neighbours and things like that. Uh, that being said, it would be cool if a Lego would actually make a Saturn One to accompany their Saturn V. I think the design would be a whole lot easier since you, you could just reuse the upper stage on it. Yeah, uh, if, but if you do, if you are a museum and you get this Saturn One, let me know and I'll come over and, you know, talk about how awesome it is. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.